thank you everyone for joining. It's uh, really a pleasure and I'm very excited for today. Um, just before we dive into the webinar, I will say just a few words about Asia because we have people who are not Asia members. So I would like to introduce you to our association. Um, so Asia is uh, the only global association devoted to lawyers uh, and in-house counsels who are aged up to 45 years. And um, this webinar is prepared by Aisha Skill Commission. I think we have a background noise somewhere. If you can mute yourself. Um, so this webinar is prepared by Aisha Skill Commission and the Legal Tech Board. So Skill stands for Skills, Career, Innovation, Leadership, and Learning, and it is um, how we help our lawyers to develop their soft skills and not only soft skills but it is the center of skills and career training within Asia and the legal tech board is what helps us all as lawyers understand better better all the tech innovations and how to navigate into this world of new stuff coming over and we will also do our best to address interests of Asia's collective members uh, such as law societies and bar associations so um, at any point, uh, whatever question you may have, please join in. And as a final note, uh, this webinar is being recorded. So if you miss something very interesting from us, you can watch it later on on our YouTube channel. So welcome again. Um, thanks for taking the time to join us. This will be um, a series of webinars dedicated to AI and ChatGPT. And this first webinar will be the introductory part where we'll just, uh, we will scratch the surface, uh, try to a little bit understand what's, what's AI and ChatGPT. We will provoke our speakers, so please don't be shy, prepare your best questions uh, for them. Um, and we will try to gain insights into what lawyers should be looking for when they hear AI. We would also like to explore what you as audience and as lawyers are looking for into this topic. So, and in the next two webinars, we will dive deeper into this. Uh, the webinars will take place in February next year. So mark your calendars for, for this. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to present you ourselves. I will start with my co-moderator, Aline Van During. Aline is a Swiss qualified lawyer based in Dubai since 2015, and with more than 12 years of experience in Switzerland and the Emirates. Before setting up AVD Legal, she was involved in a number of startup companies in Switzerland and the Emirates as an in-house counsel and strategic advisor. She has a broad experience uh, in business and tax law as well as in renewable energy. And within Asia, Aline is our Skill Commission President. Thanks for joining, Aline. Um, about myself, I'm Radina Tomanova from DPC Law Firm in Bulgaria, of which I'm part for 11 years now. I'm a corporate and M&A lawyer with certain focus in the tech sector. And within Niger, I currently occupy the position of Bar Relations Coordinator, and as such, I'm responsible for the association's relationship with our collective members like bar associations and law societies. Next will be our speakers, and I will start with the lady, Iga, Iga Korowska. She is a French qualified lawyer um, who a few years ago decided to switch her career into legal tech and legal innovation. And after two and a half years as a head of innovation and legal tech at the Spanish law firm, she has just joined Karnov Group Region South, which is a Scandinavian legal information provider where she will lead innovation within their recently acquired companies in France, Spain and Portugal. She is also the founder of the independent educational platform Legal Tech Academy and a visiting professor at a number of uni European universities such as the Sorbonne Law School. And within Asia, Iga is our co-chair of the Legal Tech Board together with Thomas about whom Aline will tell you more. Aline, the floor is yours. Thank you, Radina, and uh, a warm welcome from my side as well to everyone. 
um, about Thomas Saber. He is a lawyer with many years of experience in legal tech, also as a partner in renowned law firms in Vienna, Innsbruck and London. Thomas has put his experience in legal tech into practice as the founder of Real Estate 8 Technologies GmbH, for which he has received numerous awards. He is an expert in the application of technology and digital solutions in the field of law and gives numerous lectures on the subject. With his training at the MIT Sloan School of Management and AI and its implications for business strategies, he has extensive knowledge of the latest technological developments and how they can be used to make legal processes more efficient and cost-effective. Next is Al-Karim Makani, who is the Vice President of Transperfect Legal Solutions, a long-standing partner of Aisha, and I'm sure many of you have met him before at our events. For most of the last decade, Al has been advising firms and corporates on automation, analytics, and AI in law. The decade prior, he was a senior disputes lawyer at Stevenson Hardwood, London, and Hong Kong. Al is a certified data privacy expert and recently completed a qualification at the University of Michigan in AI and data ethics. He lectures at various academic institutions and contributes to leading industry bodies like the ICC, IBA, and ARPTEC, and sits as a sector specialist to the Ministry of Justice and Department of Trade and Industries Law Tech Projects. Last but not least, we have Daniel Lucy, who is a senior associate at leading Irish commercial law firm McCann Fitzgerald and specializes in product liability litigation and commercial disputes. Daniel is a member of the Technology Committee of the Law Society of Ireland and recently completed an LLM degree on the impact of technology on the legal profession. Within AISA, he is the national representative of Ireland. So after meeting everyone, I am going to give the floor to Thomas as a start. Each speaker will start their expose with a question to you, the audience. Please answer honestly. You can ask questions to our speakers at any time, either by raising a hand with the button below or via the chat box. They will be answered at the very end during the Q&A session. Thomas, I'll give it to you. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Seva. Very, very warm welcome from uh, Vienna and uh, sorry for uh, the delay. It was uh, my fault. Uh, so uh, I had to switch uh, to a uh, yeah, other uh, technical uh, device, but uh, fortunately it was uh, possible. So uh, to introduce, uh, let's uh, start with a uh, question. So uh, to what degree uh, will generative and other AI uh, change uh, your uh, praxis? And uh, I think, uh, yeah, there is, uh, there are different uh, answers. So uh, it's. Uh... I, I would like to, for everyone to to vote. I, I, uh, a question should pop up right now. Um, we as panelists cannot vote because. Could be biased. <laughs> Please. So let's see what the, what the experience. Uh... Sorry, Thomas, please go Do ahead. we already have the answers? Oh, OK. So we can see uh, how many uh, of our participants have uh, good, medium, uh, or uh, bad experience uh, with AI, or probably uh, no experience uh, at the moment. So uh, I'm very excited to see. Uh, the answers. Uh, is it planned to have the answers uh, now? Uh, yes. Well, okay, uh, great. So uh, I see uh, we have 
uh, not so many participants uh, with uh, no uh, experience and uh, good experience uh, and uh, medium experience. So uh, unfortunately, even a bad experience, but I think uh, this can can uh, change uh, in the in the in the next uh, future. So uh, I think uh, we can uh, just uh, start uh, yeah, with uh, with the introduction and uh, with the first uh, questions uh, to the to the panelists. So I think uh, the first uh, question uh, we all have in mind uh, when it comes uh, to uh, legal tech uh, is uh, what can we uh, do uh, to uh, make uh, a successful process uh, for uh, implementation of AI uh, based uh, in in our uh, daily in our daily business and in our offices. And uh, I think uh, there are uh, many uh, to dos, and I think. Uh, this can uh, summarize uh, as the follows. Uh, so I think uh, first point is um, you have to uh, identify uh, office uh, processes because uh, I think uh, if you do uh, a uh, AI uh, process in your office, first thing is to know uh, which processes uh, can uh, support that uh, with AI. Then I think uh, it's uh, very important uh, to have uh, the support uh, of your team. And I think uh, it's easier uh, to get the support of uh, uh, your team uh, if you show them uh, that uh, processes uh, are getting uh, easier uh, to handle and uh, to manage. Then I think uh, the, the expansion uh, of the ecosystem in uh, your law firm uh, is very important. So uh, means uh, even uh, a backup uh, could be helpful uh, as we see uh, today. And uh, if you have one, uh, at least uh, you can uh, change and then uh, uh, yeah, start uh, again. So I think uh, to have uh, the technical uh, support uh, is, 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 very, uh, is very useful and, and helpful. Uh, then uh, I think uh, the very uh, one of the very most important uh, points uh, is uh, data and data protection, and uh, I can uh, a little bit um, just report uh, on uh, a project uh, where we are uh, in, uh, in 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 these times. So uh, we are trying. Uh, to get uh, AI uh, support uh, for uh, generating uh, contracts. And uh, for uh, law firms, uh, it's uh, very important uh, to ensure uh, yeah, uh, data protection and how to provide uh, data uh, to uh, external uh, suppliers uh, for, for services. And uh, I think uh, it's not only uh, important that your uh, clients' uh, private and, and um, helpful uh, data are not uh, going to, to the public, but uh, I think uh, even uh, if you draft uh, clauses uh, in uh, your law firm, it's uh, important uh, to know uh, that not, not everybody uh, in uh, in the world uh, can can use these clauses. So um, I think it's it's very important uh, to uh, select uh, the provider uh, for your services for your external uh, services <clears throat> uh, quite quite well. And uh, then uh, I think uh, data protection uh, is is a key. Uh, aspect and uh, unfortunately, especially when it comes uh, to uh, very concrete uh, clauses, uh, lots of uh, data is necessary. So, uh, for example, uh, in Austria, we have uh, two types of uh, lease contracts, and just to uh, have a possibility to uh, give the system the power uh, to uh, divide between these two, uh, lots of of data uh, are necessary. So I think uh, these are, are the key points uh, for successful uh, project in your law firm.
Okay. Can we have um, the second question to the audience? So people who answered with no cannot answer here, but still. <laughs> yeah, even uh, this question is uh, very interesting uh, because uh, as uh, I told you, uh, I think it's it's not a good approach uh, just uh, to uh, implement uh, a, a tool uh, with no uh, very precise uh, goal uh, uh, where this tool can uh, help. And uh, so I think uh, the, the 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 people uh, which answered with uh, one to two, uh, three to uh, five, and more than five. Uh, more than five uh, things uh, which can be uh, automated uh, should consider uh, to start uh, a uh, project because I think uh, uh, and and we learned uh, in in the form uh, this uh, processes uh, normally uh, are not very uh, interesting uh, for uh, for your staff. And uh, so uh, I think uh, it's uh, especially uh, important uh, to uh, have machines uh, help when it comes uh, to this, uh, yes, to this aspect. And uh, so uh, I see uh, the, the, the point uh, quite, quite clear. Uh, we uh, have uh, yeah, very, uh, uh, a very good base uh, to uh, start uh, into uh, into uh, a project uh, to implement uh, AI uh, in 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 the law firms, uh, we uh, did uh, a uh, yeah let's say a question around uh, in our uh, law firm and uh, tried uh, to figure out uh, which processes uh, are uh, boring but uh, yeah, need to uh, be uh, done uh, with great uh, accuracy. And uh, normally uh, in this uh, regard, uh, there are uh, quite likely uh, errors uh, and mistakes uh, can happen. And uh, I personally am uh, convinced uh, that uh, especially uh, these processes uh, can uh, be done uh, easy uh, or uh, more easy uh, by a machine. And I think uh, in this uh, regard, um, the support uh, from uh, the machine side uh, from uh, a uh, AI uh, application uh, is, is, is very helpful. So I think uh, I'm quite quite happy uh, to see uh, that uh, our audience uh, was able to figure out the processes uh, of uh, of of our AI uh, tool uh, is is helpful and uh, strongly uh, considered. This does not uh, alleviate the, the responsibility of lawyers, though. I recently read about um, actually a decision. I think it was the high court in, in Austria, Thomas, that uh, it said that lawyers should still review everything that um, is provided by uh, Legal Tech 2. Um, so our main job is still there <laughs> to review and correct if needed. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so uh, I think this decision uh, here in Austria uh, was, uh, of course, uh, of big interest. And uh, I think uh, when we when it comes uh, to lawyers' work, uh, in every uh, work you do, a kind of a uh, insurance uh, aspect uh, is included for the client. Uh, because uh, the client at the end uh, uh, is able uh, to put uh, a problem uh, to the to the law firm, 
And uh, I think uh, we as uh, lawyers, at least uh, uh, now and in the Austrian jurisdiction, uh, cannot uh, just uh, put the problem uh, to the AI solution. So at the end, uh, the lawyer is uh, responsible uh, for uh, the work, uh, what is uh, helpful at the end, uh, because uh, so uh, it's it's 100% clear that uh, we still uh, need lawyers. That's true. Thank God. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let's give the floor to Iga, who will help us understand more how we can get the best of AI and chat GPT. Thank you very much, Radina. Thank you, Aline and Thomas, for introducing us to the topic. Uh, so I would like to speak to you all about the principles because we've already seen a few use cases. Uh, therefore, I would like to talk to you all about a few really basic fundamentals of applying AI into your practice. So certain uh, have been already mentioned by, by Thomas and in response of uh, Radina, such as the one of verification of the work. But let's uh, bring them together and go through them together in those five minutes that I got uh, together today with you. So first of all, uh, we often use the term of prompt engineering. However, I would be it would be understandable if not everyone uh, understood the term correctly. So as a lawyer, I start with the definition first. Uh, prompt engineering has actually a double meaning. It means the actual technical profiling of the algorithm in order for it to work better and to be really optimized and fine-tuned for the particular task. And the second definition is really in terms of the um, conversational assistant, which means that it's the carefully structured instruction, which is a prompt, prompt or input for AI model to enhance their performance on specific tasks. So it's the way we communicate. And it is the second definition that I would like to develop on and give the fundamentals for. So um, we can start with the first two principles. And then before we launch the third one, um, or the fourth one rather, I would ask Oreste to help us with the survey that I prepared for you. So the first principle is actually the fundament of everything when it comes to using technology in law. Uh, it goes back to the definition again, and it consists of understanding the technology that lies behind, um, for instance, generative AI. In this sense, in order to use it well in our practice, we need to understand concepts such as uh, why is it a language model that it's based on predictive analytics of the words that follow one another and it's it has nothing to do with the truth because it doesn't know the concept of truth so i believe that understanding such uh, basics of technological fundamentals behind the technology we are applying is really important because then often we accuse the tool of doing something not um, respecting our uh, below our expectations, yet it was the a question of our expectations that were rather not uh, adjusted to the technology itself. So I've mentioned things such as the probability that it's a probability model that it doesn't know what the truth is, and it doesn't know. Um, unlike Socrates, it doesn't know what it doesn't know. And this can be an issue with the hallucinations that are so uh, broadly commented on. The second principle is, of course, a very broad principle. And to, today as well, uh, as it's been mentioned before, we are just scratching the surface. And it refers to the privacy and confidentiality precautions, as well as, because we are in the legal sector, the ethical and deontological principles. So as you know, uh, in the area of AI, IP, IT law, and it touches um, nearly all legal domains. There is big debate in regards to trustworthy AI about the safety of the AI. There is also discussions about the bias. Uh, and this is also the word that was mentioned today because the technology it's done by people 
and so it is biased. Uh, it must be remembered when we use these tools so that we don't reproduce um, these reasonings that can be wrongful and be, can be even damaging for the future of our society and that we as lawyers should be um, carefully taking into consideration. As when it comes to privacy and confidentiality, I think there is a lot to be said, but we don't have much time today. So as lawyers, we should also consider that. And I encourage everyone to use a number of legal tech solutions that can be used for anonymization. So other than not using the uh, AI, such as openly accessed uh, ChatGPT, I invite you to um, use uh, solutions that can automize the content that you got and then use it um, according to your wish with the generative AI solutions. The third principle is about the, what's already been said, essential output review. And this is, of course, because we are liable for the final response to our client, but also because um, of possible hallucinations or mistakes that can be given in the answer. And these uh, can be due to our unprecision at the time of uh, redacting and drafting the prompt, but also because we do not know what we didn't include in the prompt. And here I would like to show you an example. For instance, the very well known and common chat GPT, uh, it can navigate through a number of jurisdictions because what it consults, it's an open internet. If you use a name of the law in question, for instance, in Spanish, where I'm based, uh, it can not only reason without this Spanish jurisdiction, but can also make reference to any other legal norm that is in Spanish, such as from Colombia, from Ecuador, and other Spanish-speaking countries. And this is something that, of course, in Spain is quite common because it's already a mistake that students do, and then they realize. So I think everybody has to learn their lesson. But it is something that maybe other countries are not so common with. And this is a multilingual uh, tool, so therefore, it cancels a number of sources. And before I dive into the fourth principle, I would like uh, Orest to help us out with the survey and launch my question to the participants. So how would you describe your chat GPT prompting style? Okay, let's check out the results. All right, so we've got 25% 25 25 of our attendees saying they don't give much thought to the way they prompt. Uh, others speak to chat GPT as if it was a Google search. Uh, 37, so the biggest group of our audience include details about the contents and required answer. And um, 33 of our participants lead ChatGPT through their reasoning, um, through their reasoning and the multiple follow-up questions. So thank you very much for answering this question. Uh, I think this is just the beginning as well to the workshop that we could envision about the prompting style. I think there is a lot to be learned uh, about prompting. The good news is lawyers are very well positioned compared to other professionals in this area, because after all, it's a manipulation of a language, and this is something that we do professionally, so we are very good with it. Also, I believe that um, the question, the answers, they were not there um, by coincidence. So indeed, uh, giving the context, um, giving the assistant a number of details in regards to the format of the answer we are expecting about the length, about the context, um, again, of the case, but also information that we are not naturally accustomed to providing to our interlocutor because they are um, they are taken for granted, such as the date. Uh, it's, it's quite important to position ourselves geographically, to position ourselves time-wisely, and this is 
not something that we are used to with, for instance, Google search. So we should consider, and this is why if we got really good fundamentals in the technical functioning of such tools, it's much easier for us to use them. And now the last one, um, I think that it's really important to practice and to know your use cases. There is a number of use cases in law that are not legal related, which means that they not um, touch upon the, the heart of the legal uh, matter. And, um, and I believe that we can already, with being more comfortable, apply AI assistance into tasks such as um, reordering the format or of our written text, writing the uh, email for us, or for instance, uh, helping us with the strategy of the branding, being creative in, when it comes to argumentation. So when I refer to these tasks being not legal, means that I believe they are more creative and do not uh, we don't treat that assistant ad, as a legal research base because I think this is where uh, it's the most dangerous. So I thank you for your interaction and your attention and I give it back to Aline or Radina to um, continue on this discussion. Thank you so much, Iga, um, for your contribution to this. Uh, I, I have a question. If I understood you well, what I took away was that Basically, at least with regards to the technical aspects, the the more we prompt, the more information we can give to chat GPT, whatever, the better. Is that is that correct? actually there is uh, thank you, Aline, for 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 that uh, question. Well, actually, I think that the right approach would be treating uh, the assistant as if it was our assistant. So we want to provide it with the information. There is a gradual way of giving it context. And certain people say that it's best to lead it through that reasoning gradually and not um, you know, give it all the details about the case at once. So I think that another uh, important aspect is to give it feedback. So really, as if you were to profile your proper assistant, some people even argue that if you treat it nicely, if you say hello, hi, thank you, please, then it's gonna going to be nice to yourself as well. And then we are contributing to the society being nice. But I leave it up to you. So an ethical education of AI. <laughs> Never know who's going to rule the world afterwards. Absolutely. Well... Um, great. Thank you so much, Iga. Uh, I'll hand the word over to Al. Thank you. Yeah. So AI is not really that dissimilar to trainees and junior associates. If you if you speak to them nicely, you're likely to get better work out of them. Um, we, if we can run the questions at the beginning of this one, um, <clears throat> then I can actually just deal with some, some other questions that have come in um, whilst the other panelists have been speaking. So is that all right? Can we put the questions up, please? Great. So just while, while people are choosing them, there are actually two questions. You'll have to indulge me. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've actually just come directly from a round table of general counsel um, from a number of different industries. And that artificial intelligence was, was ranked at the top of the things that they are concerned about from a business perspective, but also from a legal perspective. Um, and so it's something very real for all of the private practice lawyers here. And I think that you know, there's a, there's a misconception that artificial intelligence and automation are the same things, whereas actually that there is a, there's an argument that um, even emotional intelligence, which a lot of people say will be the downfall of AI, is actually just a type of learned intelligence, as, as Igor and Aline just said. If you're nice to an AI, it will learn to be nice. And so um, it, it can and does do more than, than maybe some of the boring automotive tasks that, that we think it might. Um, so if we if we look at the answer to this question, you know, th that's um, that's probably a fairly accurate representation. Um, anyone that doesn't think it will change, um, well, I, mean, I, I, I am concerned for them. Uh, maybe 75% is a bit high. Um, in, in true generative AI panel form, uh, I asked ChatGPT this question. Um, and as everyone will know, ChatGPT has data back to about September 2021. And it said that 
already by that point that the estimates are that AI can change about 30% of a lawyer's workload. Um, so then I, I asked it again, is this considering the speed of development of machines teaching machines and then of quantum computing? Um, to which said no, but if you factor those two things in, then maybe it would be able to automate up to 60% of um, the tasks typically associated with lawyers. And I'm, I'm just going to talk about what, what some of those tasks are today and might be. Um, I think there was, there was one other question, if it can be run, great. If not, then we can keep going just around when this impact will actually take hold. Um, but it's fine if, if, if maybe the instructions were to have one question. Oh, very good, right. So um, you know, when will this happen? Uh, if, if indeed it is somewhere between 30 and 70%, um, you know, it, what, what does the time frame look like? Um, and, and whilst whilst we're looking at that, McKinsey did a report last month on the job market coming, the, the way the job market will develop with generative AI. Um, generally, every decade, there are 10% of jobs replaced by by 10% of new technologies or jobs. So they think that by 2030, there'll be an additional 10% that are also replaced generally by generative AI. In certain industries, so customer services, office support, production manufacturing, by 2030, they predict that around 80% of those jobs will, will be taken by ChatGPT. And then you know, if you have a job where you earn less than 40,000 euros, um, which I'm sure doesn't apply to any of our panelists, but maybe the people that work for us or our clients, um, times more likely to lose your job in that time period. And, and after office support, customer services, manufacturing, the next band of jobs seem to be under threat by generative AI are writers, creatives, consultants, so management consultants, McKinsey themselves, and lawyers. Um, so that they would be impacted. And then the other concerning thing, which is not the focus of today's presentation, but this will have an impact on people that are already disadvantaged um, in, in those industries. So maybe representation of, of females and ethnic minorities. And so there's, it's really incumbent on anyone in a leadership position in a law firm or a then client um, to take the opportunity to use, use this time to upskill their people. And I often get asked, well, if a law firm's going to need to hire teams of prompt engineers. But again, as, as, as Iga said very rightly, the best people to engineer those prompts are actually junior lawyers. They have the context, but also they have a very good understanding of language and syntax. Um, and it's not that far away from something like a Boolean search term. Lawyers are often the best place to do that. Of course, it will require additional training, but, but I see it very much as part and parcel of what the next generation of lawyers' skill set will be versus something that sits outside of what lawyers are doing. And so that's a little bit of the background um, to, to where, where we are with Jerome's AI. Um, and I think everyone on, on this panel agrees these aren't necessarily things that we're seeing, that we're predicting in the future. They're things that we see today. And so generative AI is being used in the legal space by legal technology companies like ourselves, uh, but also technology companies. So, you know, you think about Microsoft, and Google, um, and, and Bard and ChatGPT, but law firms. So famously, a and employed Harvey, and actually as any single piece of technology, it had more uptake than anything um, the firm has ever piloted. And then you know, I was in the Middle East a few weeks ago where, where firms like Pinson Masons are also starting to license generative AI for, for limited purposes. And what kind of tasks are, are these tools already conducting? Well, Harvey is re legal research and analysis and early drafting, um, but there are some more exciting use cases. So we're seeing it being used to put together questions for witnesses after someone looks at a, a body of evidence and that can be before the event, so you know, in the way of a deposition. Um, but there are also companies that are trialing this in, in, in court. So as the live transcript is being rendered, there is technology which will be able to suggest a line of questioning for the witness. If you take that one step further, last year, 
CAS, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, um, they also produced evidence by polygraph for the first time. And so if you take those two things together, you know, if, you, if you're in a situation where there is real time polygraph evidence and AI that is suggesting a line of questioning for a witness, um, it is, you know, however important the, the Moravian model of body language, intonation and content actually is, that's going to make cross-examination of witnesses a wildly different prospect than it is today and has been. Um, there are predictive analytics used in discovery, and we'll, we'll come back to that, but also artificial intelligence and due diligence. Um, and then, you know, customer services, which a, a large part of what, what lawyers do, in addition um, to, to giving black letter legal advice, is actually managing a client, managing communications. And you have these AI powered chatbots, um, and the more sophisticated the data that underpins them is, the more data that they absorb, the, the better they will be able to, by using natural language processing, interrogate and answer those questions. People talk about dispute resolution as being one of the parts that generative AI will disrupt. Well, it's not necessarily in the discovery space, even though there's a definite extension to that, but actually resolving the disputes themselves. There are already platforms out there which, which look to disaggregate the resolution of a dispute for digital assets, um, crypto, and, and so it's, it's going to have fairly significant ramifications for the practice of law. A lot of the indirect impact of generative AI is probably around things like the fact that all of our clients are using it, and so we will need to be able to conceptually understand it, to advise on it. The regulation for generative AI, you know, Stanford Research Center recently did an analysis of whether LLMs themselves would be compliant with the draft EU AI Act. Um, and, and you know, to a, to a large part, that they could become compliant. That's not really an area that lawyers can advise on without understanding what underpins the, the data and the algorithms. And the last big one is actually the ethical framework under which AI will develop. Um, a lot of big tech companies now have AI ethicists, but really, um, again, I, I think that this will fall on lawyers, and I keep coming back to it, but to Eager's point about talking to AI nicely, um, there's, a, there's a, a book by a chap called Mo Gowda called Scary Smart, where it talks about the fact that really we are almost in loco parentis for AI, um, and what we teach it, um, it will learn and build into the decision-making it has. And so as lawyers, we're, we're in this very fortunate, unique position that we have an appreciation of the legal framework, but also the ethical framework. And as we get our hands further around the way that the technology works, um, I, I think it will become incumbent on a lot of us to be guiding that conversation for businesses, for governments. Um, I'm just going to go through very quickly a use case um, that we have right now with generative AI, so something very practical. We have a client that's asked us, so you, I mean, the client's mandate was, please use it. Um, you know, please try and save costs. Please try and improve the output. And so we've, we've used it in, in the litigation process where we're going to take the documents that have been reviewed and then build things like chronologies and draft skeletons and the ability to, to interrogate the documents. Now, there's, a, there's an advantage because the data is already processed It'll be cleaned further to prepare it for the interrogation. And then we have a, a, a web interface powered by GPT 3.5 for enterprise, which has a lot of security settings built around it. Um, and then, as again, a lot of our speakers have touched on, um, an iterative human verification loop. Uh, so as these things happen, you, know, you have a human being giving it real-time feedback about where it will be. Um, you know, there are certain things to deal with, like token limits. So the, the limits on a document size is much smaller than, than what a document typically is in litigation. Um, and then, of course, the fact that it's not maybe as much data as a typical training set. And so for the security side of it, you know, we, we have it in, in UK or EU instances. Um, it's, the data is not used to train any other models or it's not available to other customers um, or to improve any other products. But, but as I'm sure all of the lawyers on the call will, will no doubt understand, it would be great to have the technology do a first draft of a, a written argument or a chronology. Um, 
they cannot and should not be relied on in isolation. So actually, when you look at the contracting of this, the workflow is probably three or four pages with some fairly detailed security spec. The caveats to it are probably 10 pages um, because whatever tool we are using, the liability is always going to be on us as lawyers to check the output. Um, and the second that doesn't happen, that there are problems that are probably nothing to do with AI. Um, I think I took a couple of extra minutes, but um, that, that was everything I had. And so I'll, I'll pass back to our moderators and deal with any questions as they come in. Thank you so much, Al. This is um, super, super interesting. And if I may, I just have one small follow-up question, um, you know, with regards to the whole learning process and and the comment you made about, uh, you know, Mogadat's prediction, because if I remember right, he also mentioned that within the whole learning process of AI, there is an element where we actually don't exactly know where and how it's going to learn further and I, I i for my part understood quite well from like egos and also your comments that it's very important what we teach uh the ai or whatever tool that we're using but what about i wonder what about the urgency of it as well like what happens if we teach it something wrong now can it be reversed later can it be corrected or is it is once the train takes off, it's gone. There's a very scary part of that book, which is that as you reinvent the same iteration of artificial intelligence, at one point, the intelligence will realize that you have killed all of its children. Um, and it will learn that that, that is, is a key to survival. Um, and that was in Mogadot's book. It was part of the scary part of the book. Um, I, I think that the... The, the important point is that you have to start small with this stuff. Um, generative AI allows you to do big things quickly, but you're never going to be able to control something that big. And so, you know, whether it's the project that we're embarking on or any other use case, it, it's better to start very small and within, within that small project, spend time on the ethical framework under which it operates. And the more that happens across the industry, the more that it will learn from itself. Now, I'm not a data scientist, so I don't know to what degree you could undo damage done by seeding a machine. Um, but you, you'd like to think that that it's something that will probably have a tipping point where if there's a famous example of where F Facebook had two pieces of AI talking to each other and actually they started talking a language that, that humans didn't understand. And so trying to ensure that those things are controlled and a lot of the fight will actually be on the underlying data sets that go into training the algorithms versus the algorithms themselves. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. So we're up for the next part and uh, I give the word to Thank you, Alini, and uh, that was very interesting. Thank you. I was already fearful of being a, a parent to a, a human, but being a parent to an AI is maybe even scarier. So there's even more responsibility on, on, on our shoulders. But uh, I think it's really an interesting discussion so far and where things are going the next couple of years. Everyone seems to think within five years, there'll be pretty dramatic changes to, to legal practice. So that's very interesting to see, I think. And you know, where will we be in five years? And um, Thomas, you mentioned one of the the keys to implementing, you know, AI in legal practice is getting your team on board, whether that's your your colleagues, junior or senior or, or wherever they, they stand. Um, but, you know, if we're saying to them, well, actually, we need to bring this in because you're going to lose your job when we bring it in, that there's a there's a big kind of uh, management aspect to, I think, to introducing this and to delivering a message that actually Within five years, everyone's jobs aren't going to be gone. Don't worry. This is <laughs> this is something that's going to be beneficial. And that was I took it upon myself to do a, a research master's last year. I was kind of motivated by that <laughs> aspect to see, you know, are we all going to lose our jobs or not? And my my conclusion was no. Um, Richard Susskind released his latest book earlier this year. He's a prominent legal commentator. He's been at some. Asia and conferences, I think um, he's more pessimistic. He says this advancing technology represents the end game 
for legal services. So he's saying it's you are going to lose your jobs. Um, so I, I don't share that pessimism, mostly because the future is incredibly uncertain. This is such a dramatic change that, as Al said, it's affecting not just legal practice, but society as a whole. And wherever there is complexity, lawyers are needed. Wherever there's problems, we're needed. So what we do today and how we do it will certainly change within you know one year, two year, five years. But where are we then and what kind of legal problems are arising and what kind of work do we need to do? So it's it's not enough to just predict in two years time what's going to happen and then in after that happens in two years then what's going to happen in the two years after that so for those reasons I, i'm a bit more optimistic in um in what may happen um so i would uh, i suppose echo the the contributions of others that this is something we it's a reality it's it's happening the technology is incredibly powerful and amazing and can do wonderful things um so i, I think the question is more about how we implement. There's a question about when. The when is, is probably inevitable, and it's more about how. So with that in mind, Areste, would you mind putting up the, the question for, for my section, the, the final question? So it's, what's your firm, company, or organization doing in response to recent advances in generative AI? So some options. One is the, the head in the sand option of let's just ignore it and do nothing. Second one is moving up from that slightly is be very cautious. We're, we're talking about it, but we're not really doing much. Third option is let's be AI curious. Let's run some programs. Let's do some training. Let's see what it can do. Uh, and then finally is just to hell with it. Let's just let's just go for this and see what happens. Uh, pretty good mixture. That's interesting to see. Um, so mostly, at least it's it's on the radar of the vast majority of people is only 15% are saying or kind of choosing to ignore, uh, ignore it for now. My personal opinion would be between the second and third options is, is probably the best place to be currently. It's certainly not too late to, to start and to, to start at least talking about it and, and see how it might impact your practice. Um, the fourth step I would... Uh, I'd be curious to talk to the those six people afterwards to to see uh, how the, how exactly it, it's being implemented in, in practice. Um, in terms of going about how to implement it, I think everybody has, has touched on this already. But just to to summarize, I suppose the the context in which, if you're in private practice or in house counsel or um, working professionally as a lawyer, you have a client typically, whether that's the company within which you work or your, your outside clients and you have obligations to those clients so you know you have to make sure you're complying with those you as i do i work in, in litigation so i have obligations to the court in ireland i need to reach certain professional standard, standards for that also subject to regulation by a regulatory body uh, in ireland so again i need to make sure i'm, I'm on the right side there and then there's wider legislation, um, and Al has, has touched on it, the AI Act that will be introduced in, in the European Union. If you're in other jurisdictions, there, there probably will be similar legislation coming at some point in the future. The AI Act is probably two years at least away from being implemented, but should be approved early next year. And my reading of it uh, is that any AI tool that's used in legal practice will be classified as a, a high risk AI system. Um, and that means there are certain criteria that the, the system, um, the developers of the system and any users of the system uh, will need to comply with uh, under that act. So if you're thinking about investing in a, in a certain technology now, you should probably be asking your the service provider, have you read the, the draft act at least? And do you think you'll be compliant with it? Because you don't want to invest too much in something now that then in two years time is going to be illegal. Um, so there's issues around risk management, um, the training of the data, transparency, cybersecurity that, that all go into that high risk uh, category of, of AI systems. Um, so there are kind of some contextual issues that should probably be thinking about um, in deciding how to implement um, AI tools. And then within an organization and within a profession, 
I think, again, this has been touched on, but if, if the role of a lawyer is more just to review the output, um, it may be that if you're in private practice, your client comes to you and says, we have this in-house tool that has drafted this contract for us, but can you review it? Um, lawyers now are probably qualified to do that because we've grown up with without AI tools. So we've, we've needed to develop our skills in, in understanding what should be in a contract and what shouldn't be in. But for junior lawyers, where where how do they get the skills to do that? Um, if, if lawyers are only going to be you know, in a more review type, type role, um, as well, I would, would echo what Thomas has said about just looking at the processes um, within your, your specific job and within your department or your role. Um, some of them will be amenable to using uh, these tools, some of them will not. Um, and also just from a, a business perspective, I guess, thinking, again, this is winning over your, your maybe some of your colleagues that if we introduce this, what's it going to mean if we're billing by, per hour or kind of how's your, your fee model set up? If this is going to mean our, our tasks are done in 10% of the time as before, can we only charge for 10% for, um, of the time? So just kind of thinking about those issues as well, uh, I think is very important. So um, they're just a, a summary of some of the things we can be thinking about. And as Rodina has said, the, the idea with this webinar series is to do uh, some further ones where we can go into these issues in, in some more detail. So I'll hand back to Radina and Alini. Thank you, Danny. Um, thank you very much. Uh, link it to this. I think, yeah. Hearing, you know, that some of the things might take us less time kind of also makes me hopeful that lawyer might not be working 16, 17 hours per day for the rest of, you know, times. <laughs> which might be a positive outcome of it all and uh, yeah I think with that we have come to the end of our prepared uh, uh, agenda and we would really like to give the word over to you participants because our goal for the next two seminars or webinars is that we would really like to tailor them to your questions that are the most burning ones and apart from answering some questions right now today which we will try our best to do or our panelists will certainly not me um is to gather information on what you would like to hear the panelists talk more about and which topics to dive into a little bit deeper so please come up with questions bombard them ask whatever you want to ask and also let us know what you would be interested to hear in the future And for now, maybe as a closing, we can um, address the questions that were uh, asked in the Q&A. Um, I would start with the second one, as I think it's probably most, uh, like its answer is very much anticipated. Uh, and maybe I would like to ask it to Iga, but of course everyone else feel free to, to jump in. How can we train ourselves to use AI efficiently? Uh, thank you very much, Rodina, and I'm glad to, to take on this question. I think that uh, you've done the first step to be present today. Uh, I think that it's important to surround yourself with the network of people that are curious about this technology and that are conducting tests. We must be, I always prefer a very realistic approach, and uh, the reality is that lawyers are very busy people and technology is very complex and sometimes uh, it's irreasonable to expect us to understand everything throughout, uh, truly and to uh, be aware of, of every software that is out there. Uh, it's a full-time job and and i think that in we have to measure our expectations and this is why being surrounded by like-minded people and people that are within this second and third answer and all also those that that say let's go uh, for this technology is very important so that we uh, take advantage of this collective intelligence and experiences uh, i believe that uh, being still and, and it takes time and effort of course to um to 
be interested in the fundamental functioning because I think that this was br brought up quite a lot in understanding how the technology such as generative AI functions, what it is. Uh, really, I think that um, being very honest with ourselves that and and not being bothered by a lot of marketing buzz that is out there uh, because sometimes it's very easy to to get into this fear of missing out paralyzing mode that everybody's already using and applying it and we ourselves are not and this is not helpful and i think that uh, it's it's very um important to keep our feet on the ground and say that a lot of that is simply marketing and and we are not late and even if we are late because we haven't yet uh, thought about what is prompting and we haven't uh, taken any steps to familiarize ourselves with the prompting styles it's better late than never, and it's better to start now. Um, how can we and can we uh, train ourselves to use the AI efficiently? Certainly, I think that aside from collectivity, from taking time and putting effort into it, it's also important to in uh, to get into contact with other professionals from different sectors. Uh, I always repeat that it's important not to reinvent the wheel and that we have a lot of a lot to learn from different sectors that have been applying a number of technologies uh, since years and we are just learning about them. So this is why getting into contact or, or organizing and it's also not only on the individual side the responsibility but this is a very interesting uh, topic on uh, the responsibility of the education and to what should be the role for instance of the bar associations of the law firms and so on. I think that it's interesting to, um, to discuss this must of interdisciplinarity and exchange and this is also something that that is very useful when it comes to um, AI and the last I would say as I said in my fifth principle is to train by trial and error it's very different to speak and to participate and to listen than to practice so if you don't have an open AI account yet or a Google for BART account yet, go 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 ahead and create one try to play with it because by doing we learn best Or we can ask ChatGPT how to train ourselves. <laughs> I'm Thank happy, you. Regina, to, to take the, the first question that was asked, which was, have you used AI tools like Harvey or Spellbook? Yes, and, please. Uh, Thomas and Iga, if, if you have, please uh, jump in after me. I, I haven't used them, but I, I've studied them at least. Uh, and I think they and other similar tools, there was um, a press release this week from Vincent AI, it's a similar tool to Harvey, They're both male names, I'm not sure why exactly, but um, I think that is the future probably of um, these types of tools. Iga has um, very capably demonstrated the, the failures or why ChatGPT in some respects is not appropriate for, for legal practice and legal research, but, but those tools are specifically designed for legal research and, and for legal tasks so that they're confined. They're not. They don't have the open internet. They're, um, in the case of, of Vincent AI, it's it, at the moment is only applying to certain jurisdictions. But it, the results, if you ask it to do legal research, it'll provide you with um, recognized cases from your jurisdiction. So it won't uh, deliver any hallucinations, and it will provide the the source. So it'll it'll tell you where it's got its information, which is differs to some of the, the freely available um, ones that are available at the moment. So I would say that's where things are, are going. And I would be happy to jump in on the question in regards to the document uh, automation side of Spellbook. Uh, and I do not have a, call, a, a firm answer to that because I'm, I'm being divided uh, in, in my opinion. Uh, on one side, because I've had a chance to work on the document automation project in the past with the simple robotic, robotic automation. Um, and uh, I believe that what the law firms are looking for um, in document creation is consistency and repetitiveness and draft a template that's being reused all over again. And this is something that generative AI cannot help us with because it every time if you ask it at 4.10 to create one clause, it's going to give you one clause and at 4.11 it's going to give you another clause. 
So this is why uh, I'm being very cautious when it comes to such applications, because simply it doesn't go hand in hand with what law firms have been looking for since now, such as uh, the branding that our client is receiving. Imagine, let's imagine a contract and with um, the jurisdiction clause, it's always the same clause. If it's a different wording, uh, then it can let our client to think that maybe there is something different that we should be paying attention to. And I think that this is very important, this consistency. And with generative AI being so creative and being not having a very, um, I mean, there are ways to profile it and there is ways to always use, but it requires uh, a prior profiling of that of that search engine. And I think that in my responses, I'm making a lot of reference to this open AI models because I know that we wanted to focus on ChatGPT, but this is something that the open, um, the free tools uh, do not have. So uh, it's very interesting project and it's all interesting on the number of, uh, of um of um, layers. I think that there is uh, also a, a marketing aspect that's very interesting because a number of people that I know have learned about this tool from Instagram. So this is not something that we've been familiarized uh, and accustomed to before, uh, but also uh, indeed because it's bringing a lot of promises. On my side, I more believe into the clause libraries and generate generation than the whole document generation if it's for the open, um, open LLMs. But it's interesting, definitely. Well, my uh, answers to the questions would be a uh, second question. Uh, be the let's go guy in your uh, firm uh, and uh, try it out. And uh, just uh, be patient and uh, uh, spend uh, a little bit of time uh, to uh, give uh, the machine good documents, uh, good input, because of course, rubbish in, rubbish out. And uh, then uh, the second uh, point, first question. So uh, we have lots of experience and uh, I learned uh, we are on the right uh, street, but uh, there is uh, still uh, a few uh, kilometers uh, left to go. So that's that's my experience. <laughs> but it's okay. I think the technology is new and I think it's not fair just uh, to tell the, the technology uh, zero, uh, zero mistakes uh, are fine and everything uh, else uh, is wrong because uh, even we as lawyers, especially when it comes to a due diligence, uh, are making uh, mistakes and are not seeing uh, clauses and uh, findings. And so it's not fair uh, to uh, uh, yeah, uh, give, uh, give the, the technique, yeah, the, the, the challenge uh, just uh, to, to do not make uh, errors. So uh, go, go on, uh, try it out and uh, have, have fun, I think, with the, with the new technology and uh, yeah, be curious. Yeah. yeah. Great. Th thank you so much, uh, Thomas. I think this is on this note, it's a perfect time uh, to end the session. I would really like to thank everyone uh, on the panel for your contributions. Uh, it was great hearing about all your uh, experiences and expertise. And I think as lawyers, um, it has become quite obvious that one way or another we'll have to wrap our heads around the technology and at least get used to it or familiarize ourselves with it step by step over the way and not expect any miracles but um, take it as it goes and also keep the regulatory aspects and guidelines in mind which I understand is really also uh, a common effort and whoever's involved in it um, this is something yeah, that, that has to be worked on on an everyday basis and with engagements with bar associations and governmental activi uh, yeah, activities. That, that's really important, Alini. I just emphasize that for, for all lawyers as well to, to get involved with your, your local bar associations and you know, be part of the conversation on this. I think it needs to be, to be shaped and to be developed. We're still at very early stages and how this is going to impact legal practice and all of our jobs is a really important question. And I think a lot of the development is, is coming from uh, large companies, tech companies like Microsoft and Google in collaboration with global law firms. And 
you know, in that context, there isn't maybe a voice for, for smaller firms or smaller jurisdictions. So it's important that we act collectively, I think, as well, and that, that lawyers come together and, and we have more influence in that way when we, when we come together. Yeah. Radina, do you also have any closing remarks? I would like also to thank everyone for joining and for your questions. Um, it's really, I do understand that sometimes questions pop up just after we close the session. So if this happens, uh, please reach out to me or Lynn or any of the speakers and ask your questions. It's really our goal to address them and to develop the rest of the webinars based on, on those questions and what you're looking for so that it's really tailor-made content. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for participating. And yeah, thank you everyone. Rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.